I'm Robert Whitaker. I'm a journalist and I've written all about medicine for about 25 years. Um, the last 10 years I've been focusing on books and my latest book is Anatomy of an Epidemic. And now this book looks at how psychiatric medications shape long-term outcomes, which is a very different focus than what we usually think about when we think about drugs efficacy. And, and I wrote that. That book was published a couple years ago and I've been on the road almost ever since <laughs> giving talks about it. And, and, and anyway, so my passion really is just to stir a discussion with this. I think this information needs to be known because psychiatric medications have become so widely used in our society. We want to know, is it really helping us? When you look at psychiatric drugs, let's say antidepressants or benzodiazepines, et cetera, you know, they will knock down the target symptom of the disorder better than placebo over the short term for, say, six weeks. Sometimes there's not a big advantage, but generally they meet that hurdle. But when you look at how they affect people long term, and what's happening to the brain, they have a paradoxical effect. So and what I'm going to be talking about later today is how antidepressants, for example, it's pretty clear they are depressogenic agents over the long term. They actually they increase the chronicity of the disorder. With and benzodiazepines, you, say that, you see the same thing. Now, they're very effective in sort of alleviating anxiety for a couple weeks. But if you go down, down the road, you find out that people who stay on benzodiazepines end up much more anxious than, say, a placebo group. And so it, it's, um, it's this paradox in the long-term outcomes where you get the opposite of what you th think you're going to get. So antidepressants become depressogenic, anti-anxiety drugs actually increase anxiety long-term, and probably the most surprising thing, and this would be the most controversial, but there's a real strong um, s story in the literature that documents this, is antipsychotics actually change the brain in, in ways that make people more chronically psychotic over the long-term. And, th and that, that is a story that seems so totally contrary to everything we believe and know to be true. And it's certainly when I started this whole research, I was absolutely convinced of the other story. You know, that antipsychotics were very effective, they were absolutely essential. And then there's this other story that stretches across 30, 40 years where they say, uh-oh, it looks like we're making the brain more biologically prone to psychosis. And you can say the same thing. People now are saying, well, why do people on antidepressants tend to have a very chronic course? And they're putting together a biological explanation for why that is. And what they're basically saying is the drugs ultimately have the opposite effect of what is initially intended. And it's because the brain is trying to compensate for the, brain, uh, for the drugs' of, uh, presence. We have made extraordinary wide use of psychiatric drugs in this country. And at all ages, you know, we're putting five-year-olds, six-year-olds, youth on, on these drugs anyway, at all ages. Now we have had a lot of high profile killings in the last 20 years and there's obviously a lot of cultural factors involved um, and obviously I, in my opinion access to guns is involved as well. But there's a pretty strong strain in the literature that these psychiatric drugs can in fact stir a homicidal ideation such as SSRIs. Do they increase the risk of suicidal and homicidal ideation? It's quite clear that they do. And then when you look beneath when you look into the details, if you can get the details of some of these shootings, it's, it's pretty regularly you find that they've been on psychiatric drugs or they've just come off. And one of the things is if you've been on and come off, you can get, a, you can get all sorts of symptoms, withdrawal symptoms. And the thing, I think there's two things that may be going on with the psychiatric drugs and, and violence. I mean, the, the, the evidence is quite there from clinical trials, randomized clinical trials. You'll see a certain percentage of people on SSRIs that will have a bad reaction and become suicidal, aggressive, that sort of thing. So there's good randomized clinical trial data on this. I, I think there's two things happening. One is something, the drugs can stir something called akathisia. And the antipsychotics can do this as well. And akathisia is this inner agitation where you just feel like you can't get comfortable anywhere. People almost talk about it as an inner torment, an inner torture. You want to pace all the time. So if you see someone pacing all the time on psychiatric drugs, they may be having akathisia. Akathisia is well known to be associated with violence um, it's, and risk of homicidal ideation and homicidal behavior. So can SSRIs cause akathisia? Yes. Can antipsychotics induce akathisia? Yes. And is akathisia associated with violence? Yes, all that's real, real clear. Now, I think there's another thing, and this is more speculative. You know, with some of these drugs, you actually get a diminishment in your frontal lobe activity. And, and our frontal lobes are a part of our brain that say, hey, do this or don't do this. It's sort of our, you know, it's, it's the part of this that makes us human and allows us to monitor our activities. And if you lose that monitoring, you may be losing some self-reflective behavior that would, when, when a crazy idea like shooting someone 
or shooting people comes up in your head, normally this, the, the frontal lobes would say, well, that is a really bad idea. But I, now that last second part is speculative in terms of what exactly happens, but do antipsychotics diminish frontal lobe activity? Absolutely. And there is some evidence that SSRIs sometimes can do it as well. Our society has become very uh, skeptical, not skeptical, they're confused about psychiatric drugs. So, for example, in 1987, we spent about $800 million in psychiatric drugs. In 2007, as a country, we spent $40 billion, so a 50-fold increase in spending on psychiatric drugs. And, and we've been told that they fix chemical imbalances, they help people live normal lives, and, and, and they're effective for all these different symptoms. And yet, what has happened in the last 20 years? As a society, are we seeing a reduction of the burden of mental illness in our society? Not at all. The burden of mental illness just keeps going up and up and up. We have more people depressed. There's been an explosion in bipolar patients. And so now we need to ask, what's going on? And why do we keep doing it if it's not working? In other words, if we see that people aren't getting better. And there's a couple reasons why I think we keep doing it. One is it is a commercial story. So pharmaceutical companies basically tell us a story that these drugs are very effective and you've got a chemical imbalance and you take this drug. It'll fix the chemical imbalance, like insulin for diabetes, and we see ads where if you take the drug, you're gonna be walking on a beach with a beautiful woman, and we all wanna do that. So it is a story about how the pharmaceutical industry, and in collaboration with psychiatry, frankly, has told us a story. They've put out this, position, this image of humans being very happy, and that their mind's a settled place, sort of, and it, it's not a place where you feel sad or grief or anxiety. All these emotions that we actually do know are very common to human beings, especially anxiety. But they have told us a story, that's a disease to feel anxious. And they're also telling us a story, we have this magic pill to eliminate that disease. So there's been a very powerful story told. And then once that story gets fixed, habits get fixed. Doctors start saying, Oh, this is what I do when someone comes and complaining about some stress in their life. I prescribe an SSRI and I get reimbursed for that. And we have these sort of allopathic, um, you know, there's an allopathic compulsion for doctors basically when someone comes to them to prescribe a drug, that's part of what they come for. And, and you basically get these patterns set up where the whole society is set up to act in this way. Insurance reimbursement and belief systems and doctors. And it gets its own momentum. And even when you see bad outcomes, you see more people depressed, you see d disability rates rising in our country, it doesn't seem like there's a good mechanism for checking this and uh, for us to say, maybe we should try something different, like diet or exercise. However, I will say this. More and more people have been on these drugs and seen them as not really providing the promised land that they were told. And I think there is a bit of a sea change now where people are saying, Okay, how do we stay well? And it turns out that taking a, a, a Prozac is maybe not the best way to stay well. And we think about, okay, what do we need to do to stay well? Well, we do need to eat well, we need to eat right. Exercise is really good. Uh, social engagement's really good. Finding meaning in life is really good. So instead of focusing on illness, say symptoms, you know, you're, you're, you're feeling anxious, it's, the focus is changing, I think, is how do we stay well? How do we promote wellness? That's a very different paradigm, and hopefully that will, will, will gather a lot of uh, momentum in the, in the years to come. So if you look in, in anatomy of an epidemic, among other things, is I identify, I find, found 16 long-term studies that assess the merits of, of psychiatric medications over the long term for different disorders. And these were studies done by the National Institute of Mental Health, or maybe the Government of Canada or the World Health Organization, mainstream studies, and meant to say, do these medications help over the long term? And time and time again, you find that the outcomes are that the unmedicated patients do better. Now, that finding is a threat to, of course, the whole commercial industry, but it's also a threat to a belief system within medicine, within psychiatry. And so these studies, in essence, who, who governs what we learn? It's psychiatry, in essence. They write the textbooks. You know, they figure out what goes up on the National Institute of Mental Health. The experts do, et cetera. And when they get these studies, you can document this. They give them the results they don't want. They bury those studies. They just do not announce the results. And in those 16 studies I identified in Anatomy of an Epidemic, I looked to see, 
were the results ever uh, you know, um, published in the New York Times or any newspapers? And you'll find they are not. And the reason they're not is because psychiatry and the National Institute of Mental Health, those doing the studies, when they get these results, they don't alert, they don't send out a press release saying, hey, guess what, the unmedicated patients do, uh, did, did better. So there's really a thing that academic psychiatry is preserving uh, you know, one of its products, which is, which is psychiatric drugs, and that, that's a big reason for it. So I've been on the road for two years with this book, basically talking 150 days a year. And so why do I do it? It's not a, it's not a financially great thing to do, trust me. It's because I think this is such an important subject for our society because our use of these drugs has changed our society. It's changed childhood. We pathologize childhood quite a bit now. And so my passion is hopefully in some small way to provoke a societal discussion about is this paradigm of care working? And if not, what else might we do? And I think it's one of the most profound societal discussions out there right now, especially when we talk about the way we're medicating kids, because that is changing childhood. But it's also, it's also, it's changing our society, our sense of self-reliance, our, our sense of what is normal, our sense of what we should expect for life. Uh, and I think it's even changing our sense of inner resilience when we come up against those bumps, those difficulties, those setbacks in life. So my passion is this and, and why I do it. I just think thoughtful, caring people, when they get data, that I present, which they haven't really seen before, and there's reasons they haven't, they will start to, to talk about things about what to do different. So my passion is to provoke a discussion with new information.